occupation and that there would be no provisional government. And not only would there be no provisional Iraqi government, but Bremer, in fact, uh, paid very little attention to Iraqi opinion, disregarded the advice that he was given by many Iraqis, refused to speak with many of them, and, uh, and behaved in, in a remarkably rigid and, and narrow way, like an occupier. So, okay, so to your point, if we had given the Iraqi people um, a greater stake in this process, that is to say, to allow this formation of an Iraqi government so they wouldn't feel like they were being occupied, how might that have made things different, you think? Oh, I think there would have been much less resentment, uh, much less hostility to the Americans, and there also probably would have been better advice. Of course, uh, it would have been necessary to listen to them. It would have been necessary to give them some real power and some real influence, but if that had been done, and if it had been done well, then I think that a number of these other mistakes would not have been made. If I were playing devil's advocate, which I will for just, to, to, just for the moment here, um, one could argue that they now do have an Iraqi government that is now in place, and one, by any number of objective standards, could say they still ain't got it together yet. So the argument that they would have gotten it together sooner when they haven't gotten it together later suggests what to you? Well, uh, the, you're absolutely right. The present Iraqi government is a mess. Everybody agrees on that. However, uh, you have to understand that uh, the present situation in Iraq comes after we basically destroyed all of the political, economic, uh, and military infrastructure of the country. You know, mm -hmm. if, if somebody invaded the United States, toppled the United States government, fired everybody in the government who knew how to run the country, and then disbanded the military the FBI and all local police forces, and then said, now, go form a government, <laughs> we'd have a few problems. Yeah. And, and so Iraq has problems. You know, there was, there was an enormous power vacuum. We angered half a million armed men by disbanding the army with um, no severance pay. And uh, then there's the growth of an insurgency and the growth also of religious and political militias who now have an enormous amount of power in Iraq. They have as many armed men as the United States military has, and political parties derive their power in large part from the fact that they have a militia arm with 50,000 people with machine guns. And so, yes, Iraq is a mess now. You know, we took an aquarium. It was already an aquarium in bad shape. It had been under a brutal dictatorship for 20 years, but we took an aquarium and we turned it into fish soup. And when you've done that, it turns out that turning fish soup into an aquarium is a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's, that, those are the, the, the first two issues, uh, the first two problems, mistakes, put another way, that Mr. Bremer made. The latter one, um, which requires, even for me, at this point, still some explanation uh, in terms of the terminology, what we're talking about here, is this debathification program. Tell yes. me what that means and why that was a mistake on Mr. Bremer's part. Uh, Iraq was governed, uh, Saddam Hussein ruled Iraq through a political party called the Ba'ath Party. And uh, Saddam was a very nasty man, a horrible genocidal dictator. And many people uh, at the top of the Ba'ath Party were, in fact, very evil people. Uh, however, the Ba'ath Party was very large. And like, say, the Communist Party uh, under the Soviet Union, you had to join it in many cases in order to get ahead. And in fact, in many cases, in order just to survive, in order to avoid being shot, in order to keep your job. Mr. Bremer didn't understand this, and, or he felt that it didn't matter. And uh, one of the first things that he did was to order a purge of the Iraqi government, which led to the firing, the immediate firing, and the banning for life from government employment of an estimated 50,000 people, including most of the senior administrators and technocrats who knew how to run the country. And so the ability to manage and govern Iraq was immediately crippled. I assume that his argument would have been, though, that we got rid of people who had been part of a brutal regime. Yes, that okay. was his argument. Okay. And, but uh, in the first place, sometimes you need people, even though they had been part of a brutal regime, if you have to prevent a crisis and the disintegration that's of the country. Worse. Yeah. That's even worse. Right. In the second place, many of these people were not brutal people. They had been doing what they had to do in order to keep their jobs, uh, and, and in order to feed their families, and in order to keep themselves alive. And uh, there seems to have been no understanding of that. And, and the result was that these people left the government, and the government crumbled, and also, of course, these people were immediately turned into enemies.
Let me ask you finally, um, what you as a filmmaker hope comes out of the airing of a documentary like this? Well, two things, I think. The first is that with regard to the specific current situation in Iraq, I hope people will come to understand what a terrible mess this is and, and what its nature is so that when we debate how to conduct ourselves going forward, we'll do better. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that I hope is that people will remember this because this is not the last time that America will use military force. And the next time someone tells you that we have to go to war, I hope people will understand that war is not a video game and that if you enter into it casually and arrogantly and sloppily and without thinking and planning, terrible things will happen. The documentary is called No End in Sight, the filmmaker Charles Ferguson.